Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, the podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. JT Jerry Teixeira is the founder of Bodyweight Strength, an easy-to-navigate series of videos designed to take anyone from absolute beginner to a strong functional physique with minimal equipment, which includes the YouTube channel with excellent information and demonstration videos, his blog, and his email list. He's also a carnivore and the co-founder of Carnivore Clothing Co. Um, I got one of their shirts and absolutely love it. And finally, JT shares fantastic life advice on his Twitter account, which I've personally learned a lot from on many subjects. Welcome to the show, JT. Uh, Glad to be here, man. Yeah. Um, excited to finally have you on. Um, we've interacted back and forth on Twitter. Um, really enjoyed your recent podcast with Mike on Carnomad YouTube channel. Um, folks could de- should definitely go check that out too. Um, but maybe we can start with just what's your health and fitness background, JT? Um, so right out of high school, I went into the Marine Corps. And um, when I was in high school, I was a Magic the Gathering video game playing, Dungeons and Dragons playing guy, right? I was not an athlete at all. And awesome. So when, I, so when I decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to go into the Marine Corps, everybody told me I couldn't do it and thought I was insane, you know? And uh, so I ended up doing that. And that was the first exposure I ever had to any kind of actual physical training of any kind. Um, but th- that style of military training, is, it's not like longevity training. It's they're not optimizing for, you know, what, what I'm into now. So, but long story short, that was like the first exposure I had to physical training, not being an athlete or anything growing up. And then when I got out of the military, because I had at that point become active, uh, I kind of stuck with being active in a form of going to the gym, but I, I hadn't gotten any kind of training certifications. I wasn't, um, I didn't really know what I was doing. It was, I was just doing the buy a fitness magazine here and there. Um, some bodybuilding.com and those kind of websites were very, very new. This is like 2000, 2001. And so I was just kind of go to the gym, do some bench press, do some squats, you know, the, the standard. I, so I wasn't completely clueless, but I, but I didn't really know what I was doing. I hadn't really studied it. I was more worried about school and life and whatever else at that point. Um, so I would say I recreationally worked out and, you know, in my, in my early twenties, I didn't get fat. I just kind of stayed looking like I kind of worked out and I was a smaller guy. Um, but I ended up meeting my future wife and we had a daughter. And so once she got pregnant, I very quickly got fat and, um, I hadn't changed anything. Something happened around that 26, 26 when she was, so 27 when she was born. So right around that time frame, in my middle to getting on to later twenties, something shifted. Um, there was a metabolic shift. There was something going on and I just started putting on weight. And my activity level hadn't changed much, although my stress levels were through the roof with the job I had at the time. So stress definitely went up, new baby coming and all that other stuff. And I think it's, that's a common occurrence for a lot of people. It's like when they're younger, they didn't have any of these issues. And they started getting older, stress piles up, life happens. And, and so I found myself um, going from 165-ish pounds to 220 almost, like a 30 pa- going over a 38 inch waist. I mean, I was wearing 38s, but they were snug at at five, eight. So while I wasn't, I guess, morbidly obese, I I was getting pretty big. And so that my my wife and I went to the beach and she took some pictures and she'd been telling me that I'm getting fat. Right. And she's being brutally honest. And in my (laughs) mind, in my mind, I'm like, not believe, you know, I think there's like the denial or whatever. And I'm like, no, but I mean, I work out. So I'm just putting on size, you know, in my head, I'm trying to justify me getting fat. And anyways, we got the pictures developed. This is like before iPhones and everything, you know. So we got the pictures developed and I looked at myself and it just hit me that I'm I'm legit getting fat. Like it's becoming like I I realized at that point looking at the pictures 
that it was because this weight came on in a year and a half period, maybe. And so I went from not being overweight to being pretty overweight. And I guess at that point, I just kind of it woke me up to the fact I needed to do something different. Um, so at that point, I started getting a little more serious about just diet and training and everything else. But what I did was I started out with the six meals a day. I'm oatmeal and, and, and egg whites and chicken and brown rice and everything. And I, I was good for a couple of months. Like I, I was determined. Um, but I think for a majority of people, myself included for sure, that way of eating is not sustainable for multiple reasons. Um, number one, it's just not palatable. Like you can only eat so much chicken and rice before you just break. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I went from like 220, almost 220, down close to 200. So I lost about 20 pounds. I was making some progress, um, but I just knew I was getting close to a breaking point and I wasn't going to be able to continue like that. Um, and I can't remember where I heard about the book from, but I stumbled acro- across the book, The Warrior Diet. Um, and this was 2009, maybe. And so I decided to pick it up and read it. And at this point, I had been reading, you know, um, fitness magazines, men fitness, bodybuilding magazines. I was trying to figure out, hey, what do I need to do to not be, you know, to, to reverse this before I get even older and it's too late. And so from starting the traditional popular fitness route um, and then reading The Warrior Diet, when I read The Warrior Diet, it was like the first common sense fitness or health information that I had seen um, because as I read it, and it's it's an older book and there's definitely, we've come a long way since this point, but you know, just the, asking a question like, hey, do you think biologically or evolutionarily we ate six times a day? Like we would be extinct as a species, right? It, it kind of just highlighted how, how ass backwards the popular movement and, and what it means to be healthy. And so I read that book and it went against everything else I was reading and seeing at the time. But I've always been a little bit contrarian by nature and I like to experiment. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to try this, right? I, I didn't know what to expect because at that point, very few people were intermittent fasting at all. Um, I didn't know anybody personally who had done it. None of the guys I'd known from the gym, nobody I, I knew. So, but I went, I decided to go ahead and try it. And I lost, so I started intermittent fasting. I did 20 hour fast, four hour feeding window, but it, it certainly wasn't keto or anything like that. It was probably 125, 150 grams of carbs a day. Um, and I lost, went down to 170 something. And like six weeks, I ended up losing like 25, 30 pounds. It was quite a bit of weight uh, to, to where it totally blew my mind that, yeah, my strength had gone down a little bit. Um, my training intensity had gone down a little bit, but at the same time, that's not what I really cared about. I was trying to be healthy, right? And so um, reading The Warrior Diet exposed me to intermittent fasting and to low carbohydrate eating as more of a lifestyle, not just something you do temporarily to get cut when like in bodybuilding circles, right? It's looked at as like the superior way of eating and you do it temporarily. Um, so I would say reading that book is what opened me up to ancestral eating and set me off on wanting to know more about the science behind that. And in then finding some, you know, different anthropological research and things like that and looking at what we evolved to eat. And so that's kind of, I would say, the book that changed my life or changed my perspective with how I view things from the traditional gym perspective to an ancestral eating and ancestral movement and kind of changed it where I'm viewing things through an ancestral lens versus through a, I don't know what you want to call it, technological or a modern health and wellness type lens. You know what I mean? If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And thanks for thanks for going through that. And and when did the longevity interest come about? Was that around the same time or was that later on where you said, oh, all these cool things I'm doing ancestrally, how can I apply them with more of a longevity lens? Like where did the motivation come from for that? And when did you start getting into that? So the, the okay, the, so the warrior diet was written um, for a very broad audience. It's not very technical at all. It was just intuitive when I read it. I thought, hey, this just sounds like it, it just makes sense. And then once I started looking into more of ancestral eating and, and that type of deal. Um, I started coming across some early fasting studies. I mean, there was fasting studies done and they were there, but it just hadn't caught on much, you know, and this is like 2009 or 10. And so it started around this time when it really started to pick up. So that set me reading different studies into fasting. And I actually stumbled onto um, ketogenic dieting and stuff like that. And I, I tried keto back then for, 
like six weeks as an experiment. Um, but it was not as refined as I think now we have a lot more just in the community, a lot more knowledge. And, and so then I was doing it, uh, I would say not high enough fat and too lean of protein sources and some stuff like that, but it was still extremely low carbohydrate. And so that was like my first foray into it. And then years later, I went back to it around 2016 and did it much better, uh, much higher fat, higher saturated fat, and had a lot more success with it, where I just felt better energy-wise and everything. Um, but, but to answer your question, when I started reading some of the literature on fasting and some of these things, and they started to propose different mechanisms, it, and I, I'm not, you know, I don't have advanced biology degree or anything like that, but it was really fascinating to me that by basic dietary interventions – or lifestyle modifications, we can activate longevity pathways and we can do things. So, you know, you start reading into this and it really blew my mind. I was thinking, man, so eating in a hypercaloric state and, you know, eating to gain mass or gain size is not necessarily a bad thing, but it kind of made me realize that like, hey, that this may not be, and because I was kind of under the assumption at the time, and I think a lot of people are, that if I'm training and exercising intensely, if, I, if I'm working out hard, then that's very potent, you know, general health, longevity. It's, it's really powerful for that, which yeah. it is. It is. But I also think that it's, you know, only a percentage of the equation, obviously. And so if you're, if your eating is not matching your goal of your, of your training, whatever that happens to be. So if you're optimizing for longevity and you are training, um, it's going to delay the sins of your dietary sins to an extent, but they are going to catch up with you. And I think you see that in athletes where at, at some point, and even in my own case, coming from the Marine Corps, we were running a ton. I was still working out again, not intelligently because I hadn't really spent a lot of time researching the programming and the science behind exercise, but I was exercising a solid hour, hour and 15 minutes a day, even when I got fat. So the exercise didn't change, but I still ended up getting fat, even though I would be doing what for an average person is considered a high level of exercise. So once I stumbled across intermittent fasting and I started trying to dig into why it works and started reading some different studies and, and looking into that rabbit hole, basically, and then a ketogenic rabbit hole, that's what kind of opened me up to, you know, cellular signaling. And now, not until more recently, but ketone bodies as cellular messengers and all the, realizing that it's like, hey, there are actions we can take that are going to activate um, longevity pathways, anti-inflammatory pathways. And so that's that was really interesting to me. Not so much, how do I build more muscle? How do I get big? How do I, you know? So for whatever reason, that kind of spoke to me and caught my interest, um, which has really remained what I spend most of my time researching, more so than bodybuilding, hypertrophy. I, people think because I, I have a fairly decent build or whatever, that I'm really into bodybuilding. And, and the thing is, I- You're being very modest. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I have a distaste for that whole scene. You know, the whole, especially with the with the proliferation of social media, with the like, hey, everybody look at me and I'm gonna take 20 selfies a day and cameras all over the gym. Like I I, I, I detest that whole, that whole um, I don't know what to call it. It's not, I don't think a movement, but that whole like, that, that yeah, exactly. And so- you know, like if I work out, I'm there to do that to better my health. And so I'm not trying to, you know, match everything. I, like when I used to go to the gym, I didn't used to hate it. And with the proliferation of social media, it got to the point where people are hardly working out, they're taking pictures all over the place. Everybody's on. It, it got to where I didn't want to even walk in the door. And that's part of what pushed me to just switch to all calisthenics and training at home. Yeah, yeah. Why did you get into bodyweight strength training? Maybe we can hit on that. I wanted to ask that. So um, my daughter is 13 now and she's a competitive gymnast. And so if anybody out there has a kid that's a gymnast, she's level nine this year. And the highest you can go is level 10. And from level 10, you would end up, that's like pre-collegiate. And then you, you, know, you potentially go to college or whatever. Um, there's elite level, which would be for... One step above that, which is like Olympic, your, your, your potential Olympic material, right? So I don't know if she's necessarily there, but, um, but she's gotten to a, a pretty high level where the stuff she does is incredible. And when we first put her in, she was three and it's recreational. And so that was my first exposure to gymnastics at that time. 
I'm still going to the gym and lifting. I had lost most of my weight at that time. This is about 10 years ago when I first stumbled on the warrior diet and all that. So I was healthy and, and fairly fit. Um, but basically being exposed to gymnastics and while I'm taking my three-year-old, I'm seeing these people that are 14, 15, high school age or whatever. I'm seeing the older athletes and their, their physiques are pretty incredible for even teenagers, right? And so I, I kind of noticed like, hey, there's no weights in this. this facility. She goes to a pretty big gym. There's no weights. Not, they're not even there to be used yeah. in the first place. So <clears throat> the thing is, gymnasts get to a pretty high level sans any weightlifting at all. And at the Division One collegiate level or the Olympic level, yeah, I'm sure that they, they incorporate whatever is going to help them to excel. So maybe they incorporate weights at that level. But I saw these athletes and I saw my daughter over the years as she got a little older, like even to eight or nine years old. I mean, abs, you know, defined shoulders, super strong. She's stronger than all the boys in her class every year. Still in eighth grade, she's stronger than all the boys in her classes, wow. you know. And so for me, I kind of was it, it put into the gymnastics scene. And then I would start meeting coaches and stuff that were male gymnasts when they were younger. And these guys are, are built really well and super powerful. And so I started talking to some, some former male gymnasts and they're like, yeah, they've never, never lifted. Everything was calisthenics. And so that kind of made me realize that, yeah, I think I want to work some of that into my training. So I started to do some basic, way more pull-ups, variations of pull-ups, just some basic stuff at that point, right? I hadn't really tried to get very advanced or intense with it. Um, and then my wife got pregnant with our son, who's now five years old, well, almost five years old. And so when that happened, I just knew I was getting burned out at the gym. I didn't like going anymore, like I mentioned. And I had already started to incorporate some body weight strength training into my routine. And at that point, my daughter had gotten, she was about 10 years old. And so I was convinced having met gymnasts and stuff at this point and talked to different gymnasts that you can build a powerful physique without weights. So I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to fully commit myself to calisthenics and see how it goes for me. And so that was knowing that I was going to have a new baby at the house. I wasn't going to be able to get to the gym. I was already burned out on traditional lifting at the gym anyways. It was kind of a comedy of things. Um, you know, it, it was this basically uh, like amalgamation of a few different things that happened where I just thought, that's it. This is what I'm going to do. Um, and so that's how it started. It was about a month before my son was born, somewhere right in there. I just my gym membership was up. I let it go. And I looked at these, you know, guys on YouTube, different blogs, gymnasts that are doing handstands and all these advanced movements. And I kind of wrote down a set of goals that I wanted to accomplish. And I had also noticed about myself that I had a, developed a bad habit of quitting things early. And so what I decided is I thought, okay, I'm going to accomplish these things I'm writing down. And I won't go back to traditional lifting at all uh, until I accomplish all of this stuff. So like I, I want to get a two-minute handstand, front, full front lever, full back lever. All, that stuff's on my YouTube if anybody wants to know what those things are. And so a few of those things I've accomplished, but m more of them I haven't. And I'm getting close. Um, but recognizing that negative trait in myself, for example, I would start books and not finish them. Um, you know, there was classes I dropped and didn't finish when I should. So – I recognized I was starting to develop this habit of not seeing things through. And so a big part of what helped me stick to body weight strength training and not jump from thing to thing um, was just trying to trying to to kill that part of me that that had started to become a quitter, I guess. Yeah. And I think people can probably identify with that, right? You start a diet, you quit, you start keto, you quit, oh I'm gonna try carnivore, then you quit. I, I was developing that personality trait and I didn't want to have that. And so I have found that um, for me, exercise was kind of a linchpin habit that I, I knew I was going to stick with it. But this particular type of exercise, I decided I was going to stick with it. And then the continual challenge of it, um, you know, may, most adults probably don't think about this, but most of us have probably not done a handstand since we were kids. And when you get down and actually try it, or when you try some of this stuff, it, it has an, an inherent fun factor to it. Um, it's not that it's better than traditional lifting or traditional training, or if you if you enjoy endurance running, whatever it is that you enjoy, all, all physical activity is good. Um, but for me, it, it, it's almost like a form of play because you're not just doing, for example, a bench press. If you do a bench press today, you're going to be doing a bench press in 30 years. It's just going to have a different amount of weight on the bar potentially. Yeah. 
but it's never going to change. And so for calisthenics, the cool thing is that if you start today doing bodyweight strength training, in a year from now, you might be doing freestanding handstands, or you may be doing an actual skill that was impossible for you to do at the beginning. So that's the part that hooked me was the continual challenge and being humbled by the fact that I could barely do anything at the start, even though I wasn't out of shape. Um, and so that, th- those are the things that have kept me st- sticking with it is number one, trying to get to those goals that I set out years ago. And then number two, what's kept it fun and it doesn't make it feel like work is that progression of skills where I'm constantly working towards something new. So that would yeah. probably be. Yeah, that, that's great. That's really interesting. And I liked how you talked about recognizing in yourself. And I think this takes a high level of awareness that you were starting to quit things over and over again. Um, and I'm reading a really good book by Brian Tracy called No Excuses, which is all about discipline. And um, it almost talks about the opposite effect, too, where um, if you become the type of person who um, makes hard decisions and disciplines yourself to do things um, when you otherwise feel like you wouldn't want to, um, it's hard at first, but it actually feeds on itself um, and it requires less willpower over time in some circumstances. Um, so I, I think that's really interesting how you talk about like falling off and, and being hard to commit to things. But actually, when you have those small wins and those successes, you can take advantage of the opposite, too. Yeah, I definitely think there's something to be said for stacking wins and building momentum because I, and this goes back to what really changed for me. And I think a lot of people that watch or listen to your content um, will identify with this is when I started to look at things through the lens of evolution and what nature is selecting for in certain things, it made me open up my eyes and I thought, you know, we are as a species, if you went back thousands of years, if we wanted to eat an animal and, you know, we, we were, we used our brains, we were intelligent, we've always tried to avoid work. And so I think on the one hand, it makes you realize like, hey, it's advantageous for us from a survival standpoint to not go expending stupid energy, right? There, there wasn't like caveman Olympics or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I always tell people, you don't need to go train like an Olympian to, to be strong and functional and all that. You don't, not at all. But, um, but it made me realize like, Hey, I'm not screwed up because I am procrastinating. I'm not, you know, messed up because I'm, I'm lazy. I'm just human. It's part of who we are. And I mean, what I realized is, you know, historically we, we wanted to be lazy, but unfortunately we still had to put in work to survive. Like if I want water, we didn't have a tap and we didn't have a refrigerator and, and a stove and everything else. There was just a larger level of activity required to survive, period. Um, you know, to catch an animal, even if it's buffaloes over the cliff, you still have to then go clean the animal or, or cut it up, or, you know, drag it back, whatever it is that you're doing, or at least walk to the animal. It's like nowadays, we're just going to get in the car, drive to the store or groceries delivered to our doorstep, right? So right. it kind of made me realize that like, hey, I'm not dysfunctional as a human, I'm just being human. And so I think what part of us all being human is being aware enough to look down at at what our weaknesses are and addressing those. But but it's not natural to do that because our our primal drive is to conserve energy, to be lazy. Totally. You know what I mean? And so I think that's kind of goes with like the book that you're talking. I don't have to look into that book also, but I definitely think that if if you if you're out there listening and you feel lazy or you feel slothful or you hate working out. Like, I think that's normal for a human. There's nothing wrong with you. Yeah. So, so that, that was a big part of it for me is realizing, cause, cause people think also when they see me on either, you know, on social media of whatever various type of social media, they're like, well, I'm not like you cause I, I don't love working out and mm. I don't love it either. But I found a method of training that on the one hand, I want to live, like, I want to optimize health span and lifespan and do what I can to live the best life that I can. And so I know that physical activity is important. Um, and, and different people will argue for varying levels of how important it is, but, but it's important for us. If you look at ancestral diet to also look at ancestral movement. Right. And so I know I need to be active. Um, but what activity do I enjoy? And so, so body weight strength training to me, just the, the minimalist approach, being able to do it anywhere, um, with no equipment, um, that, and then the the mini progressions that keep it to where I'm advancing, that's spoken to me and I dig it. And a lot of people identify with that, but yeah, it's not for everybody. I mean, you've got to find the type of activity that you enjoy doing. Yeah, and that's then, huge. You know. And 
JC, how did how did carnivore start for you? Um, where did that come from? You know, coming from your your keto background, and how has it evolved over time? So, um, intermittent fasting to keto, and and I tried it every variation: one meal a day, two meals a day, eight hour window, six hour window. Like I I did all that stuff for for, for over the years, um, but I had never questioned the importance of plants in a diet, just because that's almost taken as a, taken as, as, as the say, it's like gospel, right? You, you know that the foundation of a healthy diet is a plant-based diet and then you add animal foods. And so at this point I was doing more paleo intermittent fasting and paleo is keto. Um, but I still up until the very end of that, um, when I started carn- carnivore, I was eating tons of spinach, tons of kale. You know, I'm eating the plant foods that are supposed supposedly the, the healthiest for you. Um, And what happened was the last four years or so, three and a half years before I started carnivore, now it's about four and a half, uh, I started to develop psoriasis on my right hand and it was progressing, you know, steadily. And I tried steroidal creams, went to some doctors and basically the steroidal creams would give temporary relief, but stop the creams and it comes back. So the underlying cause was still there. And I didn't like the fact that I know I'm just masking a symptom and I've got some kind of issue. And so I suspected that there were some dietary triggers. So I was trying, I even did the auto AIP, um, paleo. I tried autoimmune protocol and nothing, some stuff made it less, um, severe, but it never went away. And over, over time toward the end, right before I started carnivore, which was December of last year, uh, it was starting to spread to around my forehead, my hairline. And so, I had seen Sean Baker and some other, um, Amber O'Hearn and some people on, on social media. And my first impression, just because of how we're conditioned was, well, that can't be healthy long term. Like yeah. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to do that. And, but I also reasoned that nothing dietarily that you do within reason for 30 or 60 days is going to have long lasting impacts on your health. So I decided I was going to give it a shot for 30 days. And in the meantime, while I'm going through it, and gaining experiential knowledge and seeing if it helps, I would be studying and see, trying to read into it and see what I think if, if it's the right fit for me, right? Um, longer term. And so right after I dropped, I was eating a lot of spinach toward the end, um, spinach, dark chocolate and, uh, and kale doing salads every day. And so that was the last vegetables that I dropped when I started carnivore. And within 48 hours of dropping those vegetables, the itchiness that I was experiencing in my skin started to go down and the red scaliness of it <clears throat> was within about a week and a half to two weeks gone. And it was still just pink, slightly inflamed within three and a half weeks. My skin was completely clear. Um, and something else I noticed I would have GERD or, you know, gastrointestinal reflux that came and went. And when I would fast and do two meals a day, it was moderately controlled. But when I went to carnivore, it, completely went into remission as well. And as long as I stick to carnivore meals, unless I have gone to an all you can eat uh, barbecue place and eaten a disgusting amount of meat that caused some reflux issues. But, but that's, but on carnivore with no plant foods, my reflux also doesn't bother me at all unless I just willfully go crazy. You know what I mean? On any normal amount of food, eating to satiety, I've never had a problem. So, so the first month my, my skin issue and my GERD cleared up and you know, common sense to me, there's some inflammatory issues, some autoimmune issue going on. And if eating this way is going to keep that at bay, I'm going to continue eating this way. <clears throat> and so once I actually experienced it, then that set me into researching, okay, historically, how much meat did we really eat as a people before technology changed? Because the, the lion's share of our evolutionary history would have been prior to the last even thousand, two thousand years. It would have, you know, been before that. And so I was really curious as to just how much meat versus plant food are, are, did we evolve to eat? And I was pretty sold having looked at the average of all hunter gatherer societies, which are most likely eating more plants today than they would have in the past. Right. Um, you know, 70% plus is the average. And so I, I, you know, looking at that and then looking at all pretty much any controlled data that we have on meat or animal products, there's no negative consequence, right? I mean, we don't have controlled trials on carnivores or 
any of that. But there's no hard data to suggest that any of it is in any way negative to health outside of epidemiological studies. And, you know, and if you understand the healthy user bias, which I'm sure you do, it, Western studies sometimes will paint or American studies especially will paint animal foods and meat out to be negative. But then when you look at Eastern studies, those, those associations are gone. Um, so when you look at societies that don't have our healthy user bias, the, the, the data that would suggest that meat is somehow bad for you disappears. And so I'm, you know, for me, just looking at that, I don't see anything for me, you know, to suggest that eating animal foods is in any way negative for my health. Um, so once I read into it, I'm sure most of your listeners have read into it, you know, looking at it from an evolutionary lens and then just applying common sense and looking at the available data, I thought, you know, I don't see, as long as I'm getting my micronutrition met through animal foods, I don't see a reason why I need plant foods. It doesn't mean I think no one should ever eat a plant food. Um, you know, but for me, I just feel like I don't need it. Um, and cause sometimes people ask for me, salt and liver is not super delicious. <laughs> I can eat it, but yeah, I will grill onions and garlic and chop the liver up and, you know, throw, throw it in there and season it up. And so I do eat a small amount of plant foods as meat enhancers when I do liver and stuff like that. Yeah, totally. But I'm effectively from a caloric standpoint, I'm basically carnivore with a yeah. small amount. Of, you know what I mean? So totally. that's kind of where I've settled at being comfortable is I don't think I'm missing anything. I don't think I need plants, but for organ meats and stuff like that, I, I can do them if I get a little more gourmet with them. I'm not the salt and organ meat guy. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. That's where it's evolved to now. Um, yeah, I get that. I, I completely understand that. I think people are uh, carnivore is not black or white. You know, carnivore, as as defined uh, biologically, means someone who eats meat. Um, so, so saying that you know someone is not carnivore if they eat a small amount of plant foods just doesn't really make sense. Um, and and I think you know if 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 you tolerate them well and you can eat some other things and and you know eighty to ninety percent of your of your diet is meat, then that's fantastic. Um, you're on the right track. And JT, what's a kind of day of eating look like for you? Because I'm sure people are curious. So I've, I, I, I basically have three kind of protocols, I guess you would say, and they would kind of correspond to what type of eating window I want to have. And so I do do some OMAD now that I've, my, my GERD's not bothering me. I don't have issues with it. Like I mentioned, unless I just eat massive, a massive meal. So if there's a day that I don't train, I'm one of those people where I really like the feel of just being fasted um, from a mental clarity standpoint and all that. I feel good. And I think one of the interesting things with carnivore for me is that it is a form of a ketogenic diet. You know, to an extent, you're going to be making ketones when you're in, in following a carnivore diet. And then depending on the amount of protein, so, some people are doing moderate protein carnivore. Some people are doing incredibly high protein carnivore. Um, but I can eat a carnivore meal and still not have any drop in mental performance or sluggishness, but it's not, it's not every time. Um, and so I do like the way I feel, you know what I mean? So I do like the way I feel fasted. So if I don't train on non-training days, there are a fair number of days where I do do one meal a day. And when I say one meal, it's more like a four hour window. Um, I'll eat, but sometimes an hour or two later, I I'm still hungry and I'll eat a little bit more but it's generally going to be in about a four hour window. And I count that as, as, as one meal a day, basically. Um, sure. and then outside of that, cause that would be one large meal and maybe a little smaller later if I'm still hungry. And then outside of that, if I, if I work out in the afternoons, then I'll usually do a two meal a day. And if I'm working out in the afternoon, I will often do one meal that'll be smaller before I work out about an hour and a half before I train. And it'll be something like bacon and eggs, nothing big you know, maybe like five, six eggs and a couple strips of bacon. And then I'll train around like three in the afternoon or whatever. And then I'll have like a larger meal after. Um, so that'll be kind of a two day a meal set up or two meals a day set up. Sorry. Uh, and for a time I wanted to see if I could gain lean mass on carnivore. Um, and I needed to eat over 3000 calories a day, which I can do that in one or two meals. It's just less comfortable. Um, right. and so what I did is I, I did an eight hour window and sometimes it would extend to nine or 10, but I did three meals 
during a, a compressed eating window, more like time restricted feeding. And so those are the three things I've done. I was able to gain two and a half pounds in two and a half months, um, strict carnivore at this point because I didn't, didn't want anything to cloud the, the results basically. Um, but eating three meals a day and then training four days a week. And so, and there was no visible fat gain. So, cause I think one of the things that wow. is one of the things that people ask often is, can I still gain size and strength while I'm doing a carnivore or a keto diet? Um, and you can, because yeah. if you look at it in order to build muscle, all you need is adequate protein. And then you don't even need a caloric surplus or an energy surplus to, to gain muscle. So the more body fat that you have, the more you will be able to gain or build muscle tissue while you lose body fat, while you lose overall weight on the scale. And, you know, you see that all the time on social media. People start, they, they have maybe 20, 30 pounds or even more to lose. They switch to a carnivore diet, which majority of times higher in protein. And even without physical activity, the higher protein carnivore diet, then you're also eating additional creatine in your diet. If you're carnivore and you're doing plenty of red meat, you're getting additional creatine. Um, you're getting carnosine, intramuscular carnosine. You're getting things dietarily that facilitate muscle growth. So if you do a carnivore diet and you do no physical activity, your body composition is most likely going to improve, not just yeah. in fat loss, but not just in fat loss, but you're probably going to build some muscle even without physical activity. Absolutely. Right. So, and then what you see is people that also start to do some physical activity, resistance training of some type, they'll build muscle and lose fat at the same time. So, so if anybody's listening to this and somebody tells you, well, you've got to eat a surplus of calories to build muscle, that's completely false. Yeah. Um, and, but with that being said, if you, if your, if your optimization goal switches, so if you say, well, I was optimizing for fat loss. That was the main thing I wanted. If you get to a point where you think, okay, now I don't want to lose much more weight. I want to gain weight on the scale and I want to build muscle. There's a point where you, in order to optimize for that, you'd want to eat more calories. You'd want to actually consume more energy. So, so that's one of the things that I think is a rate limiting factor on a lot of low carbers, whether they're carnivore or keto is you lose a bunch of weight, you feel awesome. But certain people, for whatever reason, they get to a point where they their goal sh switches and now they want to build more muscle. And people will reach out to me and a lot, right away I ask, okay, how, how, what's your training look like? So let's figure out if you're if you're doing enough um, from a training standpoint to build muscle. But then what's your what's your eating look like? And when they tell me what they're eating, a lot of times people are just not eating enough to support or facilitate the kind of adaptation they want, which is optimizing for muscle growth. So, so that's, I think an action actionable that people have to look at is once you've lost the weight and especially in a low carb community coming from people that, and I was overweight myself. So when you finally get to where you're kind of happy with your body fat levels, it is really, really scary. The prospect of overeating it, it to the point of par paralysis. Yeah. Um, but if you get to a point where you want to optimize for muscle growth, you, you've got to eat more and as long as your physical training is supporting your eating more, what's most likely going to happen is you're going to gain predominantly muscle. Um, so, so that's just a little, uh, you know, a, a little piece of knowledge for people out there. When you become metabolically healthy, even if you were type two diabetic before, or even if you had all this, you know, potential derangement or whatever else you had, once once you've achieved a certain level of health, if you want to gain muscle and strength and that starts to become what you want to optimize for you're going to have to increase what how much food you're eating and don't be afraid to experiment with that because provided that you're physically training you're not just going to get fat again um yeah i agree yeah, with that completely uh no that's that's all helpful information jt thanks for sharing that and i know i want to ask you a, a little bit of a nuanced question um i know you're you're very interested in longevity, obviously, as we've talked about. And as you said, with carnivore, you kind of hinted at it. Not every meal after you eat a bunch of meat do you feel awesome. And I think the carnivore diet, as um, a lot of people practice it, just a high meat diet, isn't necessarily a diet that's going to optimize ketones or some would argue maybe not optimize longevity. I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of question marks there. Um, but I know you have used things like heavy cream and sometimes MCT oil. Um, yeah. and now you're using OMAD on rest days. 
Um, you know, how do you think about balancing, you know, getting enough calories to build muscle with getting enough protein to re- maintain your muscle mass with trying to get enough fat for like the higher ketones and longevity piece, you know, all of those pieces of the puzzle, people can get very confused. Um, how do you personally think about that? Um, okay. So I think that, or maybe like, you've I, already struck the perfect balance. <laughs> no, I, cause so kind of like you mentioned, I, I think that we're a lot of this anti-aging or, you know, longevity or whatever the right term for it is. A lot of this research from various laboratories and PhDs and stuff, it's, it's all very infantile still. And one of the things, if you look into, um, the cellular biology, if you look into the chemistry behind all this, like we still don't fully understand cellular metabolism. It's, this is a field that's still growing and we're still elucidating all this stuff, right? It's, it's still fairly infantile. And so I think what's happening is you've kind of got to look at everything and, and look at the various hypotheses out there and then kind of strike a balance between the various um, uh, schools of thought or trains of thought. So an example of that is caloric restriction has extended the lifespan in just about every model that they've used it in, right? So when they do it in rats, when they do it in, you know, nematodes or whatever else they've done it in, um, caloric restriction is really effective at extending lifespan. Um, but the problem is if you, and when they're using caloric restriction studies, it's 30 to 40%. So I don't know about you, but I've dieted before where I'm restricting calories to the tune of 30 or 40% on a daily basis. And very quickly, you're like freezing all the time. You're cranky. Your testosterone drops. You're, you're, you don't feel great. And so I, even if theoretically caloric restriction for a lifetime was how you live the longest, on the one hand, I don't want to be a weak, feeble, tired, cranky person for the next 50 years or whatever. And I think in the other, part of that is we are free living people, meaning that we've got to go out and navigate life. We're not rats in a cage in a laboratory, right? So where a big part of human longevity is basically being a strong specimen of your species. And I don't mean being a bodybuilder or or power lifter necessarily, but strength is a very, very strong, actually the strongest correlate to human longevity that we have. And so, you know, knowing that catastrophic injury like a hip fracture or an automobile accident when you're 75, 80 years old is going to potentially be much more damaging to you than when you're 25 years old. And so I think you have to look at the overall picture and say, okay, I want, I mean, I've got kids. I'm going to have grandkids eventually. I I want to be around as long as I can for them. And to be honest with you, I like being alive, right? I I don't want to die. So I think you have to say, well, as a human, every day I get in a car, and I drive around a vehicle that could get smashed by another vehicle. Um, you know, there, there's the risk of catastrophic injury. And so how do I best shield myself from that? And obviously muscle mass works as a protector of your internal organs. It helps work with the musculoskeletal system, having a stronger bone density, having stronger muscles. It's very protective physically. Um, but then outside of that, it also works as a glucose sink and, you know, you can, there's multiple mechanisms where, whereby muscle may actually be a longevity organ in itself. So I think there's a limit to that, obviously, probably a U-shaped curve. I think when you look at these bodybuilders of people that are just huge, there's probably a point where additional muscle mass is not beneficial. So, but, but I think for the average person who's interested in being healthy, it's like, okay, strength is strongly correlated with, with not only longevity, but with free living. Like I don't want to be feeble and in a home being taken care of. I want to be 90 years old doing calisthenics in my backyard and continuing my life as I am now. And so I think you've got to look at the, um, what quality of life do you want to sustain as you age? And that's a big part of longevity because it's not just about how long you live, but the quality with which you live. And so that's why what I was getting out with this is the people that think that the best approach is chronic caloric restriction, um, and chronic deprivation of IGF-1, if people are familiar with, you know, insulin like growth factor or these various growth factors that are stimulated in response to either um, excess nutrient intake or protein intake, to never maximize those things, you can have potentially inhibited immune function. So your immune system becomes weak over time, um, muscle wasting, sarcopenia. So I don't think being old and feeble, yeah, maybe you'll never get cancer or your risk of cancer goes way down. But if you fall down your stairs, you're going to die. You know, the, the, the likelihood yeah. you're going to die go way, way up. So 
I think that um, basically blending the blending an activity level and a way of eating that allows you to basically get the benefits of caloric restriction, of chronic caloric restriction, or a majority of the benefits, um, while still allowing you to optimize the positive benefits of of growth factors, IGF-1, things like that. And so I think that a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet, um, depending on how you do it, those things are, especially when partnered with um, resistance type exercise, are going to give you the best shot at maximizing those those pathways. And and but one thing is, I do think that if you eat ancestrally, physical activity is important for you still in my mind, but it's probably least less important for you than it is for somebody who follows a crappy diet. And the reason yeah. is when you're fasting or when you're eating low carbohydrate, ketogenic, carnivore, any of var- variant of those, you are already or calorically restricted, even if you're eating carbohydrates, if you're caloric re- calorically restricted cyclically, you are activating some of the same longevity pathways um, and anti-inflammatory pathways and things like that, that you would be activating with exercise. So I always like to stress to people, while I'm totally an advocate for exercise, I do think diet is the bigger, it's the foundation because you can you, number one, you have to either eat or fast. So I guess you don't have to eat every day, but you have to make a dietary choice every single day and you don't have to exercise every day. So, but does it need to be, does it need to be a higher fat version of carnivore for that to be true in your opinion? Um, I, okay. So I think probably the biggest, the biggest shift is, um, and I think a lot of this is theoretical cause we don't know for sure, but if you're, so, some people are eating four or 500 grams of protein a day. And in my mind, that's probably more than, well, it is more than you need. I mean, when we talk about a need versus, you know, and I don't personally do that outside of maybe once or twice to an all you can eat meat place for, yeah. for, for a single sitting. But I don't think there's any way you could make an argument for that being optimal from a health and longevity standpoint. Yeah. Um, and, and the primary reason is, that leucine rich meals, eating a carnivore diet, eating animal foods, so that is going to be stimulatory um, for insulin like growth factor, for mTOR. And that's beneficial in, in some regards, right? You, you want to build and maintain muscle mass, you want to maintain your strength, you want to have robust immune function, but overexpressing that stuff may be less than ideal. Um, and one of the reasons I think that it's still probably better for sure, no matter how much protein you eat than a sad diet or a combination of carbohydrate and protein is just because if you're eating a high carbohydrate diet, which is also high in protein, insulin has an effect um, on signaling, IGF-1 signaling and, and, and mTOR. So you're probably still better off than you would be with a blended diet if it was also high carb. So when I look at some bodybuilding diets, I really think they're probably the opposite of what's best for longevity um, because people are high carb and high protein at the same time. Um, and if you are very high protein carnivore, I think that exercise becomes all the more synergistic or important because what happens when you train, when you resistance training or specific types of physical activity, it sensitizes your cells to basically activates mTOR within muscle tissue when you, when you are utilizing muscle. And so what happens is you have IGF-1 circulating in your system. And now you, you activate mTOR, which gives IGF-1 a target to bind to. And so, um, basically it exercise works to minimize mTOR IGF-1 activity in organ tissues and basically maximize it within muscle tissue. So if you think about it, if you're eating the higher protein that you're eating, um, the more you potentially have IGF-1 mTOR um, activation. If you are also coupling that with resistance training, then you can make an argument that you are sensitizing the muscles with regards to IGF-1 and mTOR, and that's giving it a target within muscle tissue to basically build and maintain and minimizing its impact in, in you know, the, the organs like the liver and things like that. Um, but even then you know, eating that much protein is, is still definitely not necessary. Um, but 
getting back to exercise. And the reason I'm not 100% sure on this is it's not something that's really been studied a whole lot. And it's there, there's like a professor Keith Barr, if you follow Keith Barr at all, yeah. um, at muscle science, he's done some research into this. And so, um, there's hypotheses out there, but basically the higher your activity level. So if you look at like Dr. Baker, he does a lot of glycolytic exercise. So meaning that he's, he's rowing and deadlifting and training at high intensities that are very glucose dominant to fuel the training sessions. And right. so when you look at a guy, number one, he's huge. The guy's a Titan, you know, so yeah, glucose sink. So him eating four pounds of beef is probably like me eating two pounds of beef. The guy's say eight inches taller than me or something. I don't know, he, he, but he's a big, big man. So sometimes when you look at how somebody like that is eating, um, his activity level and what he does on a daily basis is basically highly glycolytic and he needs his body, his demand for glucose is probably fairly high. And you can get glucose dietarily from protein. Obviously there's multiple steps and it's, it's not an easy process, but, but if the demand is there and you're physically training and you're in high intensity training, um, you can get glucose from excess amino acids from protein. And so I think that the more active you are, the higher your protein intake could be theoretically while minimizing any negative impact from eating that high of a protein level, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, the more sedentary you are, the more I think that much protein is, is definitely not needed. And I guess you could make an argument for maybe is, is mm, could maybe be a detriment from a, from a health yeah. and longevity standpoint. So basically, I guess that's it. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the way you broke that down, JT. I, I think I have a lot of similar thoughts, um, but absolutely it's contextual based on the individual. And, and probably if you're eating four to 500 grams of protein a day and you're a sedentary um, small person, you should probably think about swapping some of that out for fat. Right, um, because you're, you're eating it. What, what people got to realize is your, your body can activate protein synthesis within muscle at a certain rate. And you're eating, and, and what you hear thrown around a lot, 30 or 40 grams of protein per session, eat that three or four times a day, um, and you're maximizing protein synthesis in the muscle. But there's some research that's come out that shows that up to 70 grams of protein per sitting is actually better. So that would indicate that you could do larger meals and, and still see a benefit, even though it may be a diminishing return, there's still a benefit behind it. And there's even some, a, a newer study I saw where they ate 20% of their protein in two meals. And there was a third meal that was 80% of the protein and whole body protein synthesis rates were even higher in that group. So that would lend itself to, I think even OMAD or even doing like one larger meal or, um, so I like to try to be careful about, um, I think that the, the most important thing is to get the right amount of protein and energy in on a, on a 24 hour basis. Um, so that means that if you eat one meal or two meal or three meals, I think that the majority of what matters is just getting that in consistently and daily. Um, but, but, and then after that as looking at your activity level and like what you just mentioned, eating protein to your activity level but not go, not overshooting your activity level by this wide margin. Um, because like on the one hand, like you mentioned, you have potentially just m more IGF-1 and mTOR expression and things than you want. And again, that's all speculative, but even if that's not the case, I've tested my, my BHB levels, um, with the ketone meter or precision extra fairly extensively. And the higher my protein intake goes, the lower my ketone production is. And that's not necessarily a bad thing all the time. Yeah, you don't want to chase ketones and endlessly. Right, exactly. And and so, but it's just a metric. I think data and information can all be beneficial. You just don't always make a decision based on on a metric. Yeah. Um. But with that being said, there's some some research and more and more research coming out to show that beta hydroxybutyrate does have um cell signaling and and, and longevity benefits, things that you want. And just having more protein or more amino acids from protein or having more of my or more beta hydroxybutyrate, I, I would rather have the ketones than I would additional protein past a certain point. Yeah. So, yeah. It's so, a, so I, it's a poor energy source. Yeah. And so I don't, I, I don't want to scare anybody like, man, enjoy your ribeye. Yeah. It's not like, you know, I, I probably eat because people are curious. I try to target about one gram of protein per pound of, of body mass. 
So I eat about 175 grams of protein a day. So I'm not advocating for low protein by any means. Sure. But but once I am roughly in that neighborhood, I don't I don't count my calories or whatever with any consistency. But once I'm in that neighborhood, I'm going to eat more fat because I'm eating to support my 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 energy, my activity level. And so I would rather get that from fats than I would protein. Um, but for a for a period, if somebody's out there saying, well, and I think this would play into kind of where Ted Naiman is at. If somebody's looking at body composition and their primary, if they're optimizing for fat loss, um, then there's a, a fairly robust amount of research that suggests that protein increases 24-hour energy expenditure. And if you increase your protein intake, then it may have a you may be burning more more energy around the clock. And so I, I don't want to scare people into eating more protein for a time. For sure, I, I've done that myself. Uh, so and I've eaten up to you know 250, 300 grams of protein a day for a period. So if, if you're optimizing for fat loss, I think you can play with increasing your protein intake. And because we're all unique, I've run across people that were, were tracking everything consistently and at a higher protein intake for whatever reason didn't feel well. And when they dropped protein and increased fat, they actually saw fat loss provided their overall energy intake was still in, you know, where it needed to be. Yeah. Um, so I think that's where um, none of this is a very exact science. For sure. And it's very us, nuanced. Yeah. And so that's why I want to be careful. I think in general, you know, there's a time and a place for experimenting with higher protein intake, and especially if you're shooting for better body composition. Yes. But I also think, and I've seen, going very high protein, you may not feel as well, and it may not give you better body composition outcomes. So, so that's just something I think that N equals one and what, why you'll have different people have tried different things and found different things to be successful. Um, yeah, yeah so. I agree with everything you said. Um, and I, I think, you know, you're, you're spot on with making, uh, some, some more, uh, tentative remarks around, um, you know, it, none of this is an exact science or we don't have exact answers to it yet. And, right. and JT, um, you know, this has been great. Really appreciate you coming on. I feel like we could easily do a part two and go into a whole list of other topics. Um, but I want to leave folks with, um, you know, tell them a little bit about your channel. Um, who's the content for and, and where can people, where should people get started with your videos if they aren't familiar with your channel? Um, and I'll link all this in the show notes at carnivorecast.com. Okay. So my goal with, uh, with my YouTube channel is, is, that no matter what content I ever produce, I, I don't want to have a paywall to, to learn the information. So even if I one day write a book or, or I've got some other stuff I'm working on, the same information will be on the YouTube channel. It'll just be org it, basically just a nice package type deal, right? So you're always going to be able to find everything on my YouTube. You won't ever have to pay for any of it. If, if, if that's where you want to go to find it, the way I structured it is, um, when you, on the main page, there's an introductory video that tells you how it's laid out. And what you'll find is a playlist. Everything's organized by playlist. And you'll find a playlist that says complete training sessions or complete workouts. And there's going to be a daily five-minute training session that's just for beginners who struggle to, to consistently exercise or consistently include phys physical activity. It's just a five-minute-a-day workout. It's only two movements. It's very minimalist. And it may sound like five minutes a day is not enough, but sometimes people have a mental barrier where they think that getting started means this big commitment. And research has actually shown that three minutes a week can produce basically significant improvements in biomarkers. So the reason I like five minutes a day is kind of what you and I hinted at earlier is that if you create a habit, um, then you, 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 once you do it every day and if you can stick with it for a month, all of a sudden now daily physical activity is a part of your daily routine. And you can either continue to just do a minimal amount, but most people at that point find that they start craving a little more and they want to do a little bit more naturally. So that's why I started with the beginner five minute a day routine. There's from there under complete workouts, there's a 20 minute a day full body, which is kind of like the intermediate step. And then it goes to a split where the volume of training goes up and you're doing a upper body and lower body. So I've got multiple training sessions under the, under the complete workouts playlist. So that's where you could go to get a full program. Okay, boom, I got my workout. And then what I did with um, each movement, for example, push-ups, you've got people who can do 60 push-ups, right? Push-ups are too easy for them. So I've got numbered playlists one through eight. 
there's a there's a number for push-ups. So if you click push-ups, it will take you from not being able to do one push-up. There will be a video for a beginner who can't do a push-up. And it'll show you how to properly do them against a wall to build a base of pressing strength. So you could eventually do them on a table or a couch and then take that to the floor. But that playlist of push-up videos will go from one video to the next, each video a little more difficult. And that progression will take you all the way to perfect one-arm push-ups. And so that's how I structured the channel. So if you're listening to this and you are sedentary and you've never exercised a day in your life, you can go on to the YouTube, you can click beginner's workout, and you're going to have body weight squats and you're going to have push-ups in that workout. But if you can't perform those movements, you can go to the playlist for squats and it's going to break it down in a lot of detail to get you squatting properly. And you can go to the playlist for push-ups and it's going to break it down from a wall all the way to advanced push-ups. So, so that's the way it's structured is complete workouts. And then every movement in any of my workouts has a playlist and the playlist will have progressions from absolute beginner all the way through more advanced. So if the thing you see me demonstrates too hard, there are easier versions you can go to. If the thing you see me demonstrates too easy and you're a beast, no problem. You can scale up to harder than what I'm doing in the video. And so that's the way I structured it. And then Again, everything's by playlist. So if I have carnivore ramblings or if I'm showing you what I'm eating or if I'm cooking something, sometimes I'll upload that kind of stuff too. Um, but the foundation of it's the, the, the physical training. Yeah, it's all excellent content and really appreciate some of your, some of your videos around, you know, wh- why <laughs> isolation exercises might not be ideal, certain splits, um, your grocery shopping tips for saving money, all, all, all awesome, uh, pieces of content. And thanks again for coming on, JT. Really appreciate your time. And uh, I hope folks really enjoy this um, because I I definitely have enjoyed chatting with you. Yeah, dude, happy to do it. If you ever want to do it again in the future, I'm I'm more than happy to do it. Absolutely. I'm sure I'll take you up on that. Have a great rest of your day. You too, man. Bye. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, You'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at carnivorecast or go to carnivorecast.com. You can also email me at info at carnivorecast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.